treasury repaying, making reparations for slave owners. There were 46,000 slave owners who received reparations in 1833. And the question was, were they, I don't know, I didn't say that they were American. I, I imagine they were predominantly UK based. That's that. Um, ding. I appreciate your explanation of white supremacy. What I've learned all these years living in the US is that this is a person who's part Swiss, part American is that I still think differently based on my early experiences, the experiences of my ancestors and the history of my country, which is all imprinted in my brain. The last couple of months sitting daily has again increased my awareness how biased I am. My bias stems from Swiss perfectionism, in parenthesis, supremacy, question mark, judging myself and others when things are not perfect. And its counterpart, the shame and anxiety when I do not live up to that perfectionism or make a mistake. Both of these have kicked in during the sits, making me often so restless that I cannot sit. So bringing this into my daily life experience, I pay attention to when I judge, no matter how irrelevant to the judgment in my thoughts. Thank you for all the learning. Well, you know, thank you for describing this very clearly. And I'm afraid to say, I don't think it's a Swiss problem only. I mean, maybe if the Swiss have a particular flavor of it, but I think many of us can relate to this. A perfectionism, a judging that goes along with it, and shame and anxiety when we don't live up to the perfection we demand. Isn't that a pretty much a good description of perfectionism in action for anybody and um if only it were only in the alps you know i'm afraid i think it's a common experience <laughs> and it's one thing that um man you know i'm always talking about allowing i'm so repetitive i'm sorry but that is one reason why it's because of precisely this kind of dynamic that can very easily kick in during sitting. And um, so what do we do? Well, I mean, one thing we can do, it's very helpful to know about the five hindrances. You name one of them, the restlessness. The, the main thing with the hindrances in the old teaching is just to be aware of them, to call them out when they're arising. So if you're having a difficult time in a sit, just go through it. Is there desire? Is there aversion? Is there dullness? Is there restlessness? Is there doubt? I mean, you give them a bit longer than that when you're checking it out. Feel, and you'll find, ah, ah, oh, yeah, maybe it's that one. Maybe it's two of them, you know, and, but, but just give it the name, name it. There are various little mottos that I've forgotten about naming things that it helps you know, name it and you free it or something. I, I can't exactly remember, but I think that might be true. Try it out. It surely helps to be able to name it. I would think you're doing that. It sounds like when you judge, you're trying to catch it. Just say, ah, there it is again. Judging. You don't have to do more than that. We don't want to get caught up in... Um, results from allowing because then we're not allowing do you see what i mean if i'm allowing i'm trying to allow something in order that it go away then i'm not allowing it so just name it and see what happens because you know again what we're really trying to do i don't know can i say that what we're really trying to the process that can happen that's a very benevolent one is that compassion arises. Compassion maybe is kind of the opposite of perfectionism or at least perf compassion. Perfectionism doesn't survive well in a climate of compassion. Judging doesn't do well in a climate of compassion. Actually, shame and anxiety they, um, you know, they really have a chance to be melted 
by compassion. And it can be that simply naming the condition arising, the mind state that's arising, is enough to start allowing it, which is enough to have compassion. Just start to sort of seep out from the, the pores of our being. Okay, I'm gonna look at another one. Um, I wonder in what sense the embodiment of many Buddhist sanghas and centers in the West perpetuate racist and ethnic biases due to the economic implications of practice. Yeah, I mean, this is always an issue. For example, it requires resources and flexibility to take time away from work or family to go on retreat. That alone, I mean, it's, it's true. In, in Asia, um, you know, again, the view would tend to come, might traditionally anyway, have come down to karma. Um, which we, we, don't, we don't do. Um, actually, if you read the book um, Zen the Authentic Gate by Yamada Cohen, there's a chapter about um, obstacles to practice, which is quite interesting. I think it's probably relevant here. He talks about something like eight different common obstacles to practice. Um, I think from our side, um, we, we, I mean, I have always said that nobody should not be able to come because of, for financial reasons. Um, we, you know, as you know, those of you who've been around Mountain Cloud, you know, ordinarily we have retreat fees because we have a center and it costs, it simply costs money to run a center which we believe, really hope we're right, is a good resource for people, a good resource for the wider community. But it can't, it can't run on nothing, you know. So it has to have some, um, it unfortunately has to have some sort of fee basis for retreats. On these virtual retreats, I think we said, you know, a pretty wide range of, um, of suggested fee but also any donation is fine, no matter whatever you can afford. Uh, and I would imagine that our, as we, assuming that we go back into the Adobe building at some point, we're gonna be continuing the virtual side of it. And we'll just keep, um, we'll just keep sort of, uh, you know, we, we, we already have systems in place, uh, what do you call them, Pro uh, what's the word? policies in place so that people can come on a scholarship basis when we have those uh, Adobe based retreats, so to speak. So I think we're doing what we can. Um, I mean, I think, um, and then there's a quite part of the question is what might Zen look like if when adapted, transformed by Latinx and African American cultures in the US? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure I'm the person to ask as a white guy. I do know that um, people say Sangha centers in the West, overwhelmingly created by white people, suit white people. And that um, some centers, like for example, Spirit Rock has been a bit of a leader in this, I think has had, um, they, they haven't, they've created groups, Sanghas for people of color, you know, and, or allowed them to develop and that's, um, I mean, maybe that's what has to happen. I mean, there's a, there's, I know some people, I mean, I think that's probably is what has to happen. And we'll see, see how that works. Um, okay. And uh, let me see what I've got here. Um, there's something about, um, well, I think I've just addressed that. Um, yeah, oh no, not exactly. The great, uh, da, 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 da. how do you think 21st century Zen can reconcile the hierarchical and patriarchal nature of the transmission of the lineage with the need for empowerment of marginalized voices, both in the Sangha and outside of it? I mean, well, first of all, I'd say one answer is simply Sambo Zen. It's not male-based. The, um, the teaching body is pretty much exactly 50%. Um, man and female. Right now, I guess it's still binary. 
They, they probably won't stay that way. Um, the, um, so I don't think the transmission any longer is patriarchal in our lineage. That's my take. Um, um, I also, I mean, the, what, what is really sort of a, too bad is there's so many koans. You know, the, the, the people in them are men. I don't, know, I don't know what to do about that. Can we just change their names? Uh, I think I gave a talk saying, why, why not just have Buddha be a woman? Does it make a difference if we just say Buddha was a woman? Does that make a difference? And actually, why did God have a son? Why didn't God have a daughter? Could we just say he had a daughter? If, if we have to believe in that story in the first place. Um, so I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm answering that very well, but I do think that Sambo Zen, um, I don't think it's quite fair to say it's exclusively patriarchal now. Henry, thank you for a wonderful virtual treatment. I appreciate you bringing up that we should be open to receiving help this morning. Can you please expand on that? I'd love to. How do you resist the urge to cling or have expectations when you start counting on help? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Oh, that's, I love this question. I mean, I, you know, I want you to explore it and tell me. I can just tell you a little bit about my own experience, my imperfect, utterly perfect, imperfect experience on this side. It's just, um, you know, I think when we're really sort of open to help in some way, um, Somehow it seems to me we no longer need to have expectations about it. Does that make sense? Like when we really are truly open to receiving help, it means that we're knowing, we're somehow trusting that that's a real possibility and that, well, we trust that. And that trust takes away the clinging. I don't think you have clinging and trusting at the same time. Real trusting is, is, a, is a close sibling to allowing. Maybe, maybe that would be... Um, this sort of level of soul work, you know, that I talked about, it should be called trust. So I'm not sure that's exactly right. And, um, I'm not, how do I expand on being open to receiving help? It's like, just, you know, just, um, here we are right now. Who made this, this moment? This moment that is you, who made it? Who, who even just intended that it arise? Here it is, arising. I think maybe this is a moment to quote that old, um, I've quoted him before, the Soviet rocket scientist, Tsiolkovsky. I, I, I got it, um, what he said is so beautiful. Um, just one second. I'm sorry, I can't actually find it, but it's something like this. The universe was created so that atoms could experience unclouded happiness. The universe creates itself so that atoms can experience unclouded happiness. This, this guy lived from roughly 1870 to 1940. He led the Soviet rocket program in the 20s and 30s. 
So he's a very clever guy. And he, he somehow seemed to have, in the, in, the, in the midst of the, you know, the <clears throat> sort of atheist regime, sort of, sort of somehow found a way to have rather a mystical take on things. that he didn't regard as anti-scientific. So what about that? This moment is all arising out of a desire, a longing, a yearning, a wish that atoms experience unclouded happiness. Okay. Okay, here's, a, here's another one. This is how I tend to see original love or basic goodness, and I'd like your help. Colon. That's the end. Oh, sorry, here it is, it goes on. Homo sapiens, through techniques of meditation, has found a way to see through the illusion of separation, and so cut out animal fear at its root. Beautiful. The self-protective evolutionary drives immediately to a large part disappear. In the resulting sense of safety, the animal drives toward connection, opening joy, are allowed to flourish to their fullest, ex fullest extent. Can such a way of considering the matter of original love be incorporated into the vision you've expressed? Can you offer a warmer, broader, more inspiring vision for this origin love that might appeal to someone who tends to see this subject in such stark cold stark terms but those sound like rather lovely terms in which to see it i think that's a beautiful way to put it i mean this is why in a way you've touched on the importance of desire and the um i mean anybody who's interested might pick up this little book on desire by william irvin the guy i've been quoting quite a bit lately he wrote the book on the stoics it's 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 not some of it's superb some of it's a, bit, a little bit longer than it need be but he says somewhere that we have the, he calls it the BIS, the biological incentive system, which is something like self-protective evolutionary drives. And it is true. I mean, I think you've put it beautifully. The illusion of separation can be seen through and it cut, it cut doing that cuts out animal fear at its root and the self protective evolutionary drives disappear. Why, why is this cold and stark? I think that's rather beautiful. Okay, I'm going to keep going with your permission. Okay, that's a nice one. Yeah, what well, I was talking about with you, you know, naming something. You name it, you tame it. Okay, that'll, that's a great one. Very succinct. So please, let's use naming or sometimes called noting. Um, there's somebody here, something here for everybody. Um, this is a, a link to a talk on historical traumas that led to the systemized relationship of white versus other, which has been continually reinforced by unprocessed trauma. Okay, I'm gonna be watching that one for sure, or listening to that one. Thank you very much indeed for that link. Just, if you wouldn't mind, folks, give me a moment, I wanna just save it. Um, I'm collecting links. If anybody wants some of the links I'm collecting, let me know. Um, okay, I really like that, honestly. This, this, that you can, yes, of course you can understand this in evolutionary terms. And I think it's right to, that desires, I mean, as far as I've tasted it myself in a, in a to, to whatever extent I've tasted it clearly, it's been clear to me at those times and still actually to this day, that desire is kind of a root system. And you, could, you can tackle desires sort of one by one as they arise and that's fine. But that actually, I think what, what Buddhism has sort of known about, and it seems to be, yeah, one of these ways is through meditation techniques exactly, or the technique of meditation, um, that actually it's possible to go rather deeper and sort of get the root system, the whole root system dug out. I do think that that's a real possibility. I think it's very, um, it's quite sort of insidious and it'll, even when that's happened, it'll still kind of creep back in. So it takes diligence and ongoing work. 
Can I keep going? Um, yeah, I know there's a book of Cohen's about women, commented on by women Roches and other land scholars. Yeah, I've got it. The problem is that most of the stories in it simply aren't Cohen's. That's an unfortunate thing about that book. Otherwise, it's great. And I think probably we could have another book that really is just Cohen's by, by women, about women. I think that would be a really good thing. In fact, one of my, I'm planning to give some talks from that book on the ones that really are Cohen's, which is about less than 30%. Okay, there's a female Christian mystic who had visions in which she experienced Jesus Christ as mother as a female presence. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Oh. Oh, even better if there were male Christian mystics who did the same thing. I bet there were some. I wonder if there were some, but I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, another one. I've been struggling with the notion of taking sides. I want to be all in against racism. Yeah, but okay, I'm just gonna jump in here. But I mean, the point is, on one level, is just getting the facts straight. It's just knowing the history. Because we've been, America has been fed false history about this. I mean, I think maybe, I don't know whether, maybe, like I said, many of you may be way ahead of me in this. But this talk that somebody recommended yesterday on, on ACLU, the, something like the true history of the Confederacy, you know, we, we've got to get educated. Uh, at least I do, you know, got to get educated. Let's at least start with that. And let's not, um, let's start there. Okay, and then see how we go, rather than say it's all too difficult. Yet some of the calls feel too narrow and idealistic and even seem to take up the same tools of the oppressors. At the same time, I don't want to bury my head in the sand and I want to engage in act. I've begun to show up and speak out a bit, but it feels like so little and perhaps soft, naive, not enough. Yeah, I mean, I just think, honestly, don't worry about not taking sides. We're on the side of truth and reality all the way in Zen. The whole thing is about getting closer somehow or clearer about reality. Think of it that way. You know, I mean, you could say, why should I be on the side of reality? I want to be on the side of delusion. Because it sounds like taking sides. I think probably, actually, there's a level of Zen practice where you do say that, but that's very, very advanced. Don't worry about it yet. We'll be lucky to get there. And I, I, I'm not even sure it's really uh, correct anyway. So can we just sort of, I mean, it's so easy to throw things in the way when we approach this subject. Already I noticed it, you know, yeah, but maybe the statistics are off. Maybe this, maybe... Let's just start with finding out what there is to find out. And because uh, there's a lot available on the subject, a lot. And it's our responsibility to avail ourselves of it. You know, one of the points in that yellow chart thing I shared was, don't be asking black folks about this. You know, we've got to find out, it's our responsibility. It's like, a, you know, I mean, it's like some sort of ex-Nazi asking Jews what happened. Hey, what's all the fuss about? You know, well, damn it, you should know, you know? It's sort of like that. I mean, you know, same with the English. You know, you know all, I mean, I grew up at a time when there was massive popularity in my sort of age group, a little bit older, reggae music. And so we got a crash course in British colonialism. And I think it would be fair to say that the sort of generation I was in, middle class, 
had a lot of sort of despising of the Brits and the British Empire because we knew, I mean, that wasn't the only source, but that was one of the sources. You know, if you just go and listen to Peter Tosh singing 400 years, 400 years, 400 years. I mean, that should send a shiver through us. 1619, was that when the first slave came to America? I think so. 1619, and look at it now. Okay, I'm gonna keep going because I'm honestly, I know I've been brazenly talking about this, but this retreat, because I think it has to be addressed somehow and as a, you know, as a, a feel of responsibility to bring it up, frankly. But I know I'm very inadequate to the task and, and I hope all I'm gonna do is in, encourage all of you to sort of, you know, educate and act. And I'll, I'll be trailing you and doing my best. Um, but I think it, it, we, I just don't think it's, I thought, you know, here I am leading a retreat called Original Love. I mean, wouldn't it sort of be almost sort of, well, would it really simply be hypocrisy not to address Black Lives Matter? You know, you know, pre, I'm a, frankly, I'm sorry to say, but predominantly white sang on Original Love. It seems to me there's something wrong if, 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 if what's convulsing the country as the country awakens again, let's hope, really awakens to its racist history and not history, its racist presence, present. You know, would, would it be right not to mention it? No, I don't think so. Not at all. Okay, another one. So let's take the side of reality and truth. I, I, I'm good with that. Okay, you said the soul is rather shy, prefers nature, etc. How does our soul inform and empower the spiritual warriors in our work in the world? Oh man, that's a beautiful question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, actually, I was quoting somebody, and I think it may have been that guy, Martin Prechtel, who's a sort of shaman writer. He's a fabulous writer. He's got a book called Secrets of the Talking Jaguar. He's a, he's a New Mexico guy. He's, part Swiss, actually, and part Jemez Pueblo, Native American. And he, and he writes kind of beautifully about these two sides of his ancestry. And he kept having these dreams. He was a sort of troubled kid. And he kept having dreams about some Native American guy in weird costume. And he kind of got into trouble, drugs and whatnot. And and went down and sort of took the bus down into Mexico and on down through Central America. I, I don't remember the details too well, kind of maybe on the run or something. And, and he got to some, it's, a, it's an amazing story, he got to some bus station somewhere down in Central America. And there's a story like he was, yeah, I think he was about to get on a bus and, and this old man pulled him off just as he was putting his foot on the doorstep. And he sort of shrugged the old guy off, and stepped on again, and again he was pulled off. And then a third time, he was getting on the bus, pulled off by this old guy. And he sort of said, okay, you know, he sort of gave up getting that bus. And a couple of hours later, he got another bus. And at the end of the journey, wherever that other bus was going, he got off the bus, stepped down, boom, right in front of him was this old guy he'd been dreaming about for years and he said to him what took you so long i've been calling you for years <laughs> and anyway that's how he tells the story he begins this apprenticeship as a shaman including an incredible account encounter with a jaguar it's a very lush good 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 book you know um, but somewhere in there, I think it was in there, he talks about the, yeah, the soul is indigenous. The soul doesn't like civilization. The soul hides from civilization. And, and partly he was saying, you know, you civilized folks or us civilized folks, 
we've got to go through trainings that allow us to sort of drop our serialized minds and ways if we're going to find our soul. But um, now, okay, now how does that tally with, you know, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's, it's shy of civilization, but in itself, it's not shy. And it has the power to, I mean, the way I would understand this, okay, and again, please take me as a, as a bumbling ignoramus, but I could understand this sort of, to, to recover our soul with its connections to other sources of power and guidance. Because a soul in that regard is more like a child. It knows it has support. It knows it. It knows it's connected. So once we've found, it may, t- may be shy and hard to find in that sense, but once you've found it, you've got support for whatever work is needed. I could take it that way. You know, because clearly there are spiritual warriors in, in, in the world. I'm sure many in this Sangha. And, and um, finding deep support. Now, in this retreat, I've been emphasizing the original love thing. Exactly. How do you deal with the suffering in the world? How do you deal with the cruelty and the, the outrageous lies in the world and, and the barbarities and the injustices? How do you deal with all that? Well, if you've got a tap root into this original love, if you know somewhere deep down, deep in your bones, that actually that's who you are, it makes a difference to how you experience the world and its problems. Now, I think it's sort of the same on this soul level. If you've got, if you can, if you've found that, you've got support. You've got deep, deep support for the work that needs to be done. Okay, that's my take on it today. Um, now, let me look at the next one. My body is a Confederate monument. Okay, I'm going to be reading that. Uh, New York Times op-ed by Carol Randall Williams. My body is a Confederate monument. Oh, man. Look, there, I think I said a little bit about this, and I want to say a little bit more, that there is quite a bit of work um, on... Um, racism, white supremacy, and trauma in the body. I think if you Google something along those lines, you'll find stuff. And it seems to me that that's kind of one, one, in addition to the education piece, that's another sort of entry point for us as sitters with our deepening attunement openness to body sensation that we i think sort of need to develop do develop in our city um, um, so i'm just going to check um, um what other ones um Okay, my grandmother's hands. That's, yes, I think I've heard about that from somebody else. Thank you very much. My grandmother's hands is a book about, I think, sort of racial, racist trauma in the body, right? Something like that. Um, And then another one. Um, How can you talk about a soul and emptiness? Is that like sort of how how dare you talk about a soul or how can you, how can these things be reconciled or can you talk about a soul? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I take it as a challenge. Um, well, look, this is why I've been talking about these different levels. There's a whole realm of practice that is dualistic. That's exactly what I'm talking about in these first two levels, so to speak, or zones, or modes, or ways, or paths of practice. That's, they're dualistic, and that's okay. Mindfulness, handling difficult things in the body. There's a meditator here. 
doing the meditation, experiencing things. Soul level. There's a, there's a being here encountering other beings, encountering other entities, encountering support. That is dualistic. And the point that I want to sort of emphasize is don't let's get confused about what awakening is. These are necessary and important and valuable modes of practice, but they're not awakening. Awakening, at the very least, is non-dual. It's a sudden loss of separation. At least that. Depending on traditions, it's got to be that at the very minimum. And I sort of say minimum meaning that's usually sort of easier for people to experience. Oneness. It seems to happen more commonly. Suddenly, what, what just happened? You know, I, I was everything, or everything was me, or, you know. That is sort of often a sort of first taste of awakening, of mood. Actually, d d d sincerely, I feel it's a glimpse of emptiness. It doesn't seem like that because it seems like there's some sort of fabric that's there, that's all things, that's one, one. But I think in a certain way, it is one sort of level of emptiness, as I said, because everything shares that emptiness. Therefore, it's when we're sort of almost clearly seeing emptiness, you see, and this is actually, I speak a little personally here, and many, many people I've met with, um, even teachers and so on, and as well as students, it often starts this way, that we don't really see all the way through, but we see enough of the way through to get this sort of impression that even though somehow you're sort of still seeing a world, it's all one. And, and it's you, you're part of it. But the, 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 this is the other beautiful thing is also that, you know, you can't have this experience without being part of it. And again, I take that as a different thing from soul work, soul experience. Because I think the soul, it's still a dualistic sort of level of experiencing. But this, this non-dual, non-separate. That's not how I understand soul. So that's how I talk about it. Different levels of experience and growth and healing and wisdom and support and ways, levels, modes in which, from which we can draw guidance, support, sustenance, nourishment in helping. Okay, a um, couple more sort of pointers here. Stories by Flannery O'Connor, James Baldwin's story, going to meet the man. Okay, I'm putting that in. Um, difficult, deeply compassionate, thank you. May I add also one of my favorite stories ever is Sun is Blues by James Baldwin. Uh, absolutely, ah, oh, one of the great short stories and I'm looking forward to reading, going to meet the man, oh man, okay. Then one more comment here. Soul as imminent, imminent divine manifesting as natural world, nature, earth, yet hidden, mysterious, dark, creative, fertile, feminine. All that is hidden, feared, and oppressed by rational man, patriarchal civilization. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's, I think that's a slightly different take on soul. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to reflect on that. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds, sure sounds right on. Um, so look, shall we, uh, no more questions. So let's, um, let's resume our, our shared sitting. Um, okay, we're, we're just, um, just sort of, uh, you know, looking at